Uh, Mo uh, Melissa uh, is the director of community services at the Beach Cities Health District, and she's going to give a brief overview of the older adults program and talk about an upcoming cognitive health program and a touch on the county's aging mastery program series. And then she'll entertain uh, questions uh, when she completes her presentation. And uh, then Tom will follow and then he'll have Q&A after his as well. Okay, welcome, uh, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. And as uh, Harriet shared, I am the Director of Community Services, and um, I'm going to walk you through this presentation, and then there'll be questions after. There's a lot of information, uh, but, you know, again, please feel free to ask questions uh, once I'm done, and I'm, I'm happy to speak with you, too, after the presentation at a later time, if you ever need any other resources or assistance. Melissa, would you be able to uh, share the uh, slides with us for... Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, okay, great. Thank you. so this is just a real high level overview of the community services department. And I like to break things down into buckets to show what we offer out of my department. We primarily work uh, in aging services. So uh, older adults, uh, I like aging services. Um, I think as we kind of dive into some of more of this programming, you'll see we do still serve though all of the lifespans out of my shop. So our first bucket here is advocacy. Uh, we provide support for individuals who need public benefits counseling. Uh, maybe they have some questions around their health care plans. Uh, maybe they're going to be new to Medicare and they, we can provide some basic information and then connecting them with other resources. We also do have Cover California enrollment specialists where they're able to really walk people through the plans and options and help them enroll. Uh, we also do support um, in the South Bay uh, homelessness services. So those individuals who are experiencing homelessness and we are involved with the Redondo Beach Homeless Task Force. Um, we offer our space in our office uh, at 514 North Prospect for community partners, such as people assisting the homeless path, if they need an area to have a meeting potentially with one of their clients, uh, if they're needing to scan IDs or make oh, copies for yes. their clients, we're able to help support that too with our space. As we move into the information and referral programs. So we are really the, we are the first point of contact for the district. So we receive all of the intake calls. So that means we could have a mother calling for their 14 year old daughter who's in need of mental health resources. We could have an adult calling saying, hi, my, you know, my father lives in Arizona. I want to move him here. He's 90. Where do I go from here? What do I do? Uh, we might have um, a, new, a new couple call that's uh, expecting a baby and they need resources for parenting classes. So out of my department, uh, I have a, a lead who takes the lead on all those intakes. They call in the number. Uh, to the district, and then we are really helping them connect them with those resources. We have a heavy web presence. So if you go online to our bchd.org, our website, there, uh, there's a resource area where you can find resources in real time if we're not open during business hours for any all of our categories and those health-related support services. Then as we move in over into healthcare integration, uh, this is where we're really focusing on our care management program. And our care management program has been around for over two decades. And I'm gonna go into real detail about this soon, but it, it, it's for adults who are 60 plus and adults between the ages of 18 and 59 who have a disability. And these individuals do need to live in Redondo, Hermosa, or Manhattan. And I'm gonna go through it, but you'll see here, we look at that medication management component, dementia support, cognitive health support. We focus on end of life planning because we do serve our clients through the end of life. And then really that mental health component too for our clients. 
Uh, the dementia support, I do want to mention, uh, we are involved with the Dementia Education Consortium. Uh, and this is a group of local experts in the memory impairment field. Um, so they all, again, are those really those exp experts with cognitive impairment. And they vary from the Kensington to Silverado, Always Best Care. We have Opica, which is a little bit more on the west side um, that focuses in those adult daycare type services. Um, and we are here really to empower and promote and promote advocacy and education for the South Bay overall. Um, and we do about every quarter speaking engagement. Uh, we have one coming up in September on grief and loss. And uh, once I get the, that flyer is finalized, I will make sure to get that to Harriet so she can send that out to everyone. And then as we move into community education, uh, Harriet mentioned our new cognitive health series. Um, this is new programming for the district. We're, I'm very excited about this. Um, it's gonna be a four week series and it's gonna be offered about every quarter. It will be a hybrid series, which means two of the weeks will be in person at a local senior center and the other two components will be offered virtually. And we're gonna be focusing on nutrition and exercise. So those will be the in-person components. And then two of the other weeks will be really heavy education or training. And that could look like uh, education in mindfulness, uh, mindfulness in the aging, uh, best practices for caregivers, uh, volunteerism and how that's a health benefit, uh, especially again, as we are looking at what are the health benefits? How do we look at community health here at Beach City's Health District? We're going to use local experts in the field. Um, I mentioned Opika, Carol Hahn, which some of you may know, she's a nurse educator. Uh, you know, she'll be one of our presenters. We have a wonderful registered dietitian that we've been working with for many years that will be providing those nutrition courses. And so we're finalizing that right now. And again, once that information is ready for the public, I will make sure Harriet gets it to share with all of you. And that Cognitive Health Series will be ongoing. And then we're really tying that program into local aging initiatives at the state level and the local level. So everything from really looking at the California Master Plan on Aging and looking at how is health reimagined. So we're gonna tie some of our educational and training programs, uh, again, into these local initiatives, um, into the goals of these local initiatives uh, at the county and the state level. And then we offer caregiver support, community fitness. We already offer in each uh, of the three cities and their senior centers fitness classes uh, that we do help fund. Um, so that could be Tai Chi, mindfulness, agility, balance, and coordination. Um, one of the cities just requested an aerobics class. So that is part that runs out of my shop and we do coordinate that. And then we have, as I was just sharing about community nutrition classes, um, life planning too, we're really talking with our clients and giving a lot of referrals out for that life planning, whether it's advanced care directives, uh, whether it's for finances or healthcare or wills and trust, we do refer out, we, we are not, we don't have any legal staff on staff, uh, but again, we are making those referrals to trusted agencies. Then our subsidized services I'm going to talk about with our care management program, but we also do have a small child and adult medical fund um, if somebody is uninsured here locally, uh, maybe maybe a, a, we had a situation once where a very young child was uninsured, they were switching plans, and they hurt their tooth really bad and we had to help assist them and so we have a very small fund for that at the district. So now I'm going to move into our care management program. Um, this again is really about improving the quality of life and maintaining independence for our older adult residents and residents with disabilities. So that's anybody, uh, yes, Harriet. Yeah. What uh, I want to know, which are the programs that are for the three cities that you serve and are open to other people? So I could, when I send you the flyers and information, I can be specific. So like our dementia education, um, if somebody's willing, if we, that that's virtual, so we get people from all over. Um, if we have our other virtual programming, you know, people do might come in and maybe they're in another city, but they're they're watching it live. Uh, if we offer programming inside of our building, um, majority of the time they do live in the three cities too. But I'll make sure, Harriet, when I'm sending you that information, I can let you know. Okay, but, uh, just a minute. I think there's some problem with people getting in because and. Um, I don't know. Terry, is there any way you can help? 
You're muted. I'm not sure how I would do that. I don't know. Um, because Yvette said she couldn't get in and I don't see uh, Marcia, Marcia or Carol. So I don't. Uh, I see Carol. Carol. Oh, she. Okay. Carol's there. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me, uh, I'll send some of the to you, Yvette. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Melissa. Okay. So okay. this program here for care management uh, is R for residents in Hermosa, Manhattan, or Redondo. Um, and this is really is uh, our plan is to age successfully at home. And this is where my team of uh, trained social workers are going in the home to provide confidential in-home visits and assessments, along with recommended care plans. Because again, this is a free service to district residents. Um, there's no charge for this planning. And because we don't uh, bill insurance, there's no requirements in terms of time limits. So we've had clients with us for two years, five years, 15 years, that the goal is to really uh, go along the journey with someone and their family through the aging process to help wrap our arms around them and to provide them that support. So we're really looking at, again, how do we remain independent in their home as long as safely possible while still staying connected to the community. And that could be through volunteers coming in the home. That could be through our virtual programming, especially coming out of the pandemic, as we all know, when we were all virtual all the time, you know, really just making sure that people feel connected is, is very important. Uh, it's a health benefit and it's very important to us at the district. Melissa. Yes. Mentioned Carol uh, is here. And the two of you are talking about the, the village also in terms of uh, complementing or supplementing each other's uh, programs in in regards to keeping an older adult independently at home and safe. Yes, uh, we, we've met with the village. They've, they've come in to present to our community services department. So our social workers are aware of their services too. So, so mm -hmm. here with, so here, this is where this assessment piece here comes in. And this is done by our staff. Again, they are all, they are all in the helping field. Um, majority of them are master's level social workers. We do have a few licensed clinical get my, workers any, um, on staff too. Sound down my and so these are components of the assessment that we look at. It could be everything from insurance to income to health assessments, nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, what type of support systems do they have? What type of activities of daily living can they do for themselves? What do they need support with? And then mm -hmm. we're really looking at to a home safety assessment. How is the bathroom set up? Are the rugs do, safe? Do, is there a button to press? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does somebody, does somebody need grab bars in the bathroom? And then we're looking at this ongoing managing systems and so the healthcare system. How can we be a strong liaison for others um, and make sure that they're connected with all of those systems for, their, for the best quality of life? A short follow-up. What if your client has already long insurance or is already partly covered by Medicare? So this is completely separate from that. So if they're a district resident, they're eligible for our services. Majority, our clients have their own health care plans. This is really separate from that. And we work with those systems too. Yes. Thank you. Uh-huh. And then we offer uh, heavy volunteer support. So this is one of my favorite things about the district here is just our, our team and village of volunteers. And these are five core programs that we offer for our clients. Um, you can Many of our clients have, might have two services. So they might have a conversation companion, which is just a friendly, a friendly face to come in and talk with maybe more of an isolated older adult in the community. We have Aaron volunteers, Move Well, which is the physician approved program to help people that aren't able to go out to the gym. Uh, that's too much for them, but really they were still working on strength and balance in the home. And then our support line is an opportunity for those well-being checks for volunteers to call in and just to see a friendly, a friendly caller to see how someone's doing and how the week has been for them. And then this is just kind of giving an overview of uh, how many clients we serve on an annual basis. Um, mm -hmm. We saw a little bit of a dip in uh, 1920. We, we go by fiscal year. So, you know, July 1 to June 30th. And that was partially due to the pandemic. 
understandably so nobody wanted a new social worker in their home we did a uh, we did a lot over the phone and kind of like through telehealth um over over zoom and over the internet here possible facetimes um but this past fiscal year we served more clients than we ever have in this program. Um, and again, I think because of our visibility uh, throughout COVID with testing and vaccines, uh, Tom's gonna talk a little bit about that, but I can tell you in our shop, we did an older adult vaccine clinic in each senior center throughout the three cities. We also did homebound vaccines uh, where we partnered up with nurses, the fire department, where we actually went into people's homes who were not able to leave because they're homebound and we provided the vaccine for them. Wow. And then this just shows here, again, just a breakdown. Majority of our clients are female, 25% uh, are male. Uh, because Redondo is the largest city, we do serve a, a higher proportion of clients in Redondo and then Manhattan at 22 and then Hermosa at 9%. And then this is, I'll go over this very quickly, but this is just to really understand who our clients are. Majority of our, when we break that down into acuity levels, and so not too much medical stuff here, but uh, you know, majority of our clients are either moderately vulnerable or highly vulnerable. And so they have limited support systems. They really lack that social support. They're highly dependent upon our social workers, our volunteers. Again, it takes the village. So how we wrap our arms around them in different ways. And then uh, again, these clients can move throughout kind of these acuity levels, depending upon their situations. If somebody, let's say, has a fall and is hospitalized for a month and then they're going into a rehab, they might again become a higher acuity, but we're supporting them through their journey of aging. Mm -hmm. And then this is our senior health fund. Uh, this is for individuals strictly in our care management program. So they have to be enrolled in a as a client, but we do subsidize support services such as non-medical home care, adult daycare, durable medical equipment, the, the, the fall button, the emergency response button, medication dis, uh, dispense systems. And we use the federal poverty levels to meet these guidelines. So if someone's up to 600%, they're eligible to receive these services. And typically 90% of our caseload, they are low income. And so they do meet these guidelines. So about 90% of our clients um, are eligible to re receive this senior health fund where we're helping subsidize services, again, to keep them safely at home while still staying connected. This slide here shows our, uh, every three years, we reevaluate our health priorities. We send out surveys to uh, our local residents, uh, to community partners, um, to really identify what are the greatest needs. And then we base our programming, our budgeting uh, off these health priorities. And I've just highlighted here, kind of bolded um, uh, out of these four health priorities that we're following for the next three years, how our programming for aid, the aging population meets them. So for example, mental health, uh, decreasing isolation and loneliness across the lifespan. I'm um, really, again, focusing on that socialization pieces and how we're meeting those needs. We also sit on, and I think some of you do too, oh, sorry about that, uh, the Los Angeles County, um, no, I'm sorry, not the Los Angeles County, but Los Angeles Social Isolation Coalition um, that the television motion picture runs. And so really just focusing on, again, how do we really decrease isolation and loneliness, which can be two very different things uh, across the lifespan. Then also physical and brain health. We meet that with our fitness classes, our nutrition classes, our new cognitive health series, public health and safety. I shared with you, we really do look at emergency preparedness for our clients. And as you all know, we were very active during uh, those first two years in COVID um, where we've heavy focus, again, really shifted all of our priorities to meet those, those increasing uh, urgent needs of the community. And then substance use. So a part of our care management is we really are looking at that medication management component. Uh, and clients were really, uh, again, referring them to their physicians, their neurologists to make sure, are they on the right meds? If someone's reporting maybe some side effects, we're encouraging them to talk with their doctors. So that's where those home safety assessments come into to really making sure we're looking at all of the components of our clients. So I know that was, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see all your faces. Um, there we go. I know that was a, a lot of information, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I think 
the biggest takeaway that I always like to leave people with is if you think a friend needs help, and again, it doesn't have to be an older adult, but if you think a friend needs help, that you please make sure they're calling the district and that we're able to really handhold through the referrals, the connections, um, making sure that the right support systems are in place and they and they have the resources to make informed decisions. Um, so that's very important. What I'm going to do, Harriet, uh, I'm going to email you to make sure everyone has my contact information and has our intake line. Um, so everybody has that information uh, from you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, that was a lot of information and it went so fast. I went, oh, uh, a little hard to, yes, to. I'm glad we recorded. Terry? I'm glad um, we're recording. I was really surprised to hear that 90% of your caseload is at the federal poverty level or below. I mean, I don't think we normally think about that in the beach cities. Right, right. Right. Yeah. So I would say probably right now we're at about, oh, and I see Tom just joined us, but uh, right now we're probably at about 95%. Yeah. But historically wow. 90, 90% are under those federal poverty levels um, and they really have limited uh, support systems. And that's why we really have a high acuity level through our care management program. What's your best way of reaching them? <clears throat> Um, I would say a lot of our referrals are word of mouth. Um, we're highly visible, as you know, throughout the lifespans, whether it's a school district, whether it's, you know, community partners, local faith-based agencies. We get a lot of referrals um, from fire and police first responders. Um, again, you know, we are, uh, as I was sharing with you, our nutrition courses or exercise courses, classes that are offered in the senior centers, we get referrals from them as well. Uh, but really, it's that word of mouth. We have many clients in some of our uh, senior housing complexes. So not assisted livings, not skilled nursing, strictly the, the senior housing complexes like Acosta or the Manhattan Beach Villages. Yeah. And, you know, one friend shares with another about, hey, this is really helpful. Like, I can't get to the grocery store anymore. And Beach Cities brings my groceries. A volunteer comes every week and they're at my doorstep. And so again, that word of mouth, which is really powerful as we all know, um, is, is such a great referral source for us. Good to know. Yeah. Please, anyone else, uh, you're all welcome to ask questions and before uh, moving ahead, you have questions? Yes, Yvette. Uh, what is your source of financing? Or maybe you covered this before. I had a little trouble getting in and uh, hope I'm not making you repeat something. Yeah, no problem. You know, I think when Tom does, uh, Tom, if that's okay, if you take that when you do our, our your presentation, he can answer that question too for you, Yvette. <laughs> But you did not miss that. Uh, you missed maybe a little bit about our community services department. And I'm happy to have Harriet share my information with you if you need some, uh, if you'd like to share that information. Thank you. Yeah, Thank of you. course. Yeah. How about transportation for people getting to the service? So every city has local, as you all know, um, certain transportation, whether it's dial a ride. Uh, some of our errand volunteers, especially prior to the pandemic, some of our clients would actually go with some of the errand volunteers to the grocery stores and things. Um, out of the senior health fund, the subsidy I was sharing about, uh, there is a small portion sometimes where if somebody, we have a client right now, um, actually about a year ago going through chemo and the daughter was going through certain circumstances. And so through the non-medical home care, we helped provide small transportation to and from the hospital for, her, for the chemo appointments. Um, but primarily we're really connecting them with their city resources around transportation. Melissa. Yes. Um, you have a tremendous amount of services programs and I'm curious, what percent of the services, what percent of your staff are paid staff and what percent are the volunteers who also help deliver this, the services? So I have, we have right now, uh, we have six uh, care managers that manage the caseloads. All, so all six full-time? I'm sorry, what? All full-time? Uh, no, there are three full-time and three part-time. 
And then mm -hmm. we also, um, my manager carries a very small caseload. I carry a very uh, five and under small caseload. And then on any given day, we probably have about 30, 35 volunteers mm -hmm. um, that support our care management clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, are we still having that arrangement with the BC the Health District that Manhattan Beach has a full-time case manager? Yes, absolutely. So okay. Manhattan Beach we, is paying for her salary, right? Uh, they pay for part. They pay for part of it. So we've had that mm -hmm. for many years. Uh, we just... Uh, the contract was just proved again for the next five years. Um, and that individual, which is a very unique um, offering to the city, very mm -hmm. beneficial. It's again, it's really that high touch in the Jocelyn Center, in fire, in police. There's a lot of mediation. There's a lot of those direct referrals. And again, those managing the systems and the networks and the support systems. Um, but yes, yeah, she is there very frequently. And that's that's been in place for many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, she comes to the Tuesday or the mm -hmm. meal programs. You know? Yes, 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 yes. Down and chat with the seniors. So. Yes, and we also offer, uh, there's virtual chats now that, you know, but again, we're going back to this in-person where we have our care managers go out to the senior centers. Um, I, you know, I, I love face to face. So being able to meet somebody in person and maybe just start brainstorming and start building that rapport and that connection. And then we're planting seeds about, this is what we offer. Maybe in the future, you'd be interested. So again, kind of that visibility and that connection starting to build. So uh, that's an important piece of what we do too. Thank you very much, Melissa. You yes. did Thank you. Thank a, you. a full picture of what uh, goes on at the uh, B City South. Of course. Uh, uh, center. So um, district. So I think it's yeah. It's, it's when you can help us. Uh, find out what who who can attend thing the uh, programs outside so, of the three cities to make that uh, more clear. Yeah. So Harriet, when I send over to you some of the information that I was sharing about, I'll make sure that that is clear. Um, again, the Dementia Education Consortium, the upcoming one on grief and loss, um, that is virtual. Um, so we we get participants. Again, that is a, a regional effort uh, that we are involved with. Um, so that's a great opportunity. And that's going to be a two-part series. The first part is really going to be focusing on grief and loss. And the second component is going to be around protecting your mental health. Um, and so that will be problem looking at my calendar I'll probably have that flyer within the next three to five days to be able to send to you Harriet is the the cognitive is okay I may because of all the information my brain doesn't pick up things that quickly is the cognitive health program program what so the that? cognitive health that program will be uh Two components of it, the nutrition and exercise will be in person. So that will be offered at a senior center in each of the three cities. And then we have the virtual component, which is the education piece or the training piece um, that will be open, uh, that will be virtual. So everything that's virtual, virtual is virtual outside the three cities? Well, if it's virtual, I mean, a majority of the individuals who join are within the three cities here, kind of in that regional area, uh, depending upon what the event is. And, and Harry, I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit more of, of some of these things in detail, too. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Appreciate us. Of course. Appreciate it. And now we know a bit more about, a lot more about what is going on for se seniors at the Beach City South District. So absolutely. Again. And then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, CEO here, Tom Backley. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, Tom. Hi. Thank you. It's good to be here. So Tom is the uh, CEO of the Beach City Health District, mm -hmm. and he's going to talk about the Healthy Living Campus and the upcoming uh, programming for older adults. And then Great. he'll he'll entertain questions when he is finished. So go, go ahead. Uh, Great, all right. Well, thanks for having me. I'll, I'll uh, move through this kind of quick and feel free to uh, ask any questions that, that you might have. Just wanted to uh, give a quick COVID update. As, as you know, the health district pivoted a few years ago when COVID broke and we were able to really focus on 
testing and vaccines, as well as errands and meals. And so these are just some of the uh, numbers that we'd like to share with people as far as what we've been doing over the last couple of years to help the community uh, through the pandemic. We did over 155,000 tests uh, between the Galleria and over at our, our campus there on Prospect. Uh, as most of you know, we own the old uh, South Bay Hospital there on Prospect and Barrow. So we were able to do about 155,000 uh, tests out of that location. Uh, we were able to also uh, do about 23,000 uh, vaccines. We did 74 uh, clinics. Uh, we were able to do about 16,800 doses uh, for kids 12 and up. Uh, because we were doing Pfizer and we knew how to handle that vaccine, which was kind of tricky with, with the cold, keeping it cold and all of that, we were able to uh, work with the schools to get vaccines for the kids as well as, as the teachers. And then, as I mentioned, we were able to do lots of errands and meals and, and we had over 500 volunteers help us do that. So uh, normally when I talk with folks, I just want to give them a quick, uh, quick update on COVID and some of the things that we've been able to do in the last couple of years. So Melissa has been talking about our, our programs uh, for older adults. I, I want to talk about uh, kind of what we're looking to do uh, with our campus and really providing a, a community space for the health and well-being uh, and, and healthy living in the beach cities. And so as many of you know, that's that's an old hospital building there on, on Prospect and Barrel. And we've really, between Blue Zones and uh, the services that Melissa is talking about, as well as some other things that I'm really excited to introduce to you today, we've really evolved from, from that campus. And we wanna talk about some of the planning that's been happening uh, potentially for, for a redeveloped campus. So what we're really, one thing we're really excited about, I'm just gonna go quickly through this, is the Alco project. This is a project for uh, youth in the beach cities. And what it is, is it's a youth um, mental health facility. So it's a place where youth can come and get mental, mental health services without uh, the stigma that often happens uh, if they go into a doctor's office or a psychiatrist's office. And so I wanna talk with you a little bit about that um, because that's gonna be happening on our campus and we're gonna be opening that on the fourth floor of the old uh, South Bay Hospital uh, here in the next couple of months. So the reason why we're doing this is uh, some of the data that has come back regarding uh, where our youth are, for instance, uh, percentage of youth have reported experiencing chronic sadness or hopelessness in the past 12 months. You can see that uh, our 11th graders there, it's gotten a little bit better. You can see it kind of spiked up in 2021 for 11th graders, that last row there of 45% compared to LA County of 34 and state of California of 37. So we've come back down to the average um, there for 11th graders, but you could see that we've been trending uh, a little bit uh, high compared to LA County and, and California for this statistic. Uh, this is the one that, that of course has us uh, concerned. This is the percentage of students who reported seriously considering attempting suicide within the past 12 months. And so you can see that our numbers for the 11th grade are, are high, you know, any number would be high, of course, right? But 18% uh, is, is high uh, compared to LA County and compared to California for 11th graders. Uh, our ninth graders are, are a little uh, more in line with the percentage, but again, any, any kid uh, contemplating uh, or seriously considering suicide is, is, a, is a problem for us. But this is one, so this is what we're reacting to a little bit as far as, all right, how can we help these kids at an early age get the mental health services uh, that they need? And so through this center, this mental health center on our campus, these would be the types of services that they'd be receiving, mental health, physical health, substance use, mm. peer support, family support, and then education and employment services. And they'd really be focused around life skills, life skills and wellness services. So this is what it would look like. You can see it's not your typical doctor's office. The whole idea behind this youth wellness center or the All Cove project, it's a play on words, of course, but uh, is that it's a place where kids can come and 
easily access services. You can see it doesn't look like a, uh, a hospital or it doesn't look like a doctor's office. Uh, they would be met by a peer instead of a physician or a psychiatrist. And again, the whole idea is to try to have it be a place that kids, uh, that youth age 12 to 25 want to come to. So that's something that we're planning to start right now in our uh, on the fourth floor of, of the hospital building. And when we talk about the hospital building, we talk about uh, that large building in the middle there, the, the, um, along the bottom of the slide is Prospect, and along the left-hand side is Barrel. And you can see today that uh, this is a building that was built in the late 1950s as a hospital. Uh, it's just kind of a sea of parking. Those of you familiar with Blue Zones, I can almost definitively say there's nothing really Blue Zones or, or healthy about this campus because that wasn't something that was really thought of or contemplated uh, in the 1950s. And so we wanted to uh, create a place that really reflects who we are today uh, and, and also kind of carries on our, our health programs into the future, which, which have evolved. So we started out this work about five years ago with working on a master plan, and you've, you've probably heard or, or seen different things. There, there have been um, concerns over the years about the master plan. Is it too big or too tall? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what that all means here. Uh, today, but we started out where we were, um, as you can see on the left, we were adding in this concept of uh, assisted living. Um, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that and what that means as far as the continuum of care for older adults. As you know, today we have memory care with Silverado already in the building. We have 60 units there with 120 uh, beds or, or capacity. So this contemplated independent living on the left, uh, contemplated assisted living and memory care. Uh, and what we heard back was, hey, too much. Uh, we want more green space. We want there to be a better connection to the neighborhood. And we want it to be intergenerational. We want it to be something that really um, appeals to everybody, not just older adults. So we came back with, and, and we want there to be a, a center of excellence that really showcases uh, the health programs that we have, like Blue Zones or We've been able to reduce childhood obesity in Redondo, which is very rare and, and something that we've been studied for. And so people want to just kind of highlight that. So in the next drawing in 2019, we came back literally with a center of excellence. That's what the circular building is in the middle. We still had uh, 420 assisted living units. We did not, we, we got rid of the independent living units. It, we didn't think that we really needed to be uh, doing that, but we wanted to keep the assisted living units. That was in 2019. Yeah. And then we came back with the master plan. And again, this is a plan um, that the board uh, adopted in uh, 2021, in the fall of 2021. We did an, what's called an environmental impact report or an EIR uh, that looks at, okay, what are the impacts to this? And when I talk about the project, we want to redevelop our campus in a way that's consistent with our health needs, impacts the neighborhood to the least extent possible, and then generates program, uh, generates revenue for our programs. I heard earlier there was a question about our, our finances. Our, um, I don't know that we have the finance slide in there, but we do. I can just tell to you off the top of my head, our operating budget is about 14 million uh, a year. About 4 million of that comes from property taxes. Uh, about 2 million uh, comes from uh, fees for services like at the Center for Health and Fitness or at the AdventurePlex. Uh, and then about 2.5 million comes from uh, revenue that we receive from the old South Bay Hospital. Uh, and then we get some revenue from some partnerships that we have. We have a partnership with Silverado uh, in Hermosa Beach. So I don't know if you all know that or not, but uh, Beach City's Health District uh, owns the land and is also a limited partner uh, with the assisted living and memory care in uh, Hermosa uh, at the Sunrise facility. Uh, we receive money from grants. We, we have some grant money coming in for that Alco project, as well as some federal money for uh, drug-free communities. And then we receive a little money uh, from other sources like interest and, and that sort of thing. Um, 
so that's what makes up our budget. And so, uh, as many of you know, I, I used to be city manager in Hermosa, and my background's city management. And so, as I look at our revenue stream, it, it's pretty diversified, where we're not completely reliant on property taxes. We're able to uh, provide more services than just four and a half million because we've been able to be in these partnerships and we've been able to use our assets for medical purposes or health purposes and then also use rent uh, from those assets to then fund more preventative health and community health services. Uh, just in looking at how come there aren't more organizations like us to, focusing on preventative health and community health, it's because it's very hard to fund. And so the district has uh, has found a way to fund it that's consistent with the health needs that you all have told us that you have. Every three years, I think Melissa talked a little bit about our health priorities. So every three years we go in and we ask you what, what your health priorities are and we set our programs and our spending based upon what we hear from you. So this is what we're currently contemplating in, in the master plan um, is that we would have the alcove project that I just mentioned, uh, that helps us be a little more intergenerational. Uh, we would have uh, community services, the, the services that Melissa just talked about with the care management and the information referrals. Uh, and then we would have residential care for the elderly or assisted living. And so uh, we would have 217 uh, assisted living and, and memory care units so that's up from the 60 units that we have today, but significantly down from where we started uh, with 420. Uh, we want to have a place that's called PACE, which is a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. It's a one-stop place where older adults can come have all their health needs met, whether it's adult daycare or whether it's uh, prescriptions or whether it's seeing doctors or just having a place to gather. Uh, that is something that we're contemplating on the campus. And then we're looking at two acres of open space. So when you can see from this drawing, this feels a little more blue zones to me, a lot more open, a uh, lot, you know, it's not just a sea of asphalt. But again, we're, we're trying to um, redevelop our campus in a way that meets our health needs and impacts the neighborhood uh, to the least extent possible. So uh, we know that some, uh, near the project or, or still have concerns and we're looking to address those and we'll talk about how we're doing that. But you can see how we've made changes over the years. Um, and we, we're gonna show you just sort of a three dimensional look of, of what the site could look like uh, after phase one. Uh, so what we would do is we the, the current building would come down. Um, so as you're walking from prospect this is wow. what you would see, obviously, the open space and, and having a place where people can gather and be healthy is, is uh, obviously something we're very interested in. Uh, this would be before phase two. I didn't talk much about phase two. In phase two, we'd be looking at potentially an aquatics facility and the Center for Health and Fitness would need to come back on the campus, but we would still be able to have all of this open space. So wow. you can see here's somebody exercising. Again, two acres is about the size of two soccer fields. And so we want to create this green space in Redondo as a place where people can come and be healthy. You can see on the right there, that's a labyrinth. Some of you maybe have done that. It's a place where you can walk and, and meditate. Um, you can see up, coming up here on the right, the uh, garden boxes. So this would be where we would continue our work that we do in the schools. This would be a demonstration garden. As many of you know, we're in uh, all of the Redondo schools and, and two of the Hermosa schools with uh, garden boxes and garden programs. Mm -hmm. So this would be a demonstration place for that. You can see now where we're moving kind of east. Um, Torrance is just uh, over the hill here. And so one of the things we did is we took out uh, any building development along this edge, that was a concern of theirs. When you look straight in here, that's where the Alco project would be straight ahead. So that's where uh, the youth mental health facility would be and then PACE would be right next to it here. And so this building here is the assisted living and the residential care for the elderly. So there's been some concern about the height of this building. 
Um, you can see when we turn the corner here, it is uh, taller than the office building that's there today by about uh, one or two stories. So we are looking at the height. The, the trick on the height, we're not we're not building a tall building because we want a tall building. We're building a tall building because we want as much open space as possible. And so that'll sure. be the trade-off. If if we want to make this shorter, you see that gray building straight ahead. You know, if we want to make it the size of that and be able to have our development have our development partners be able to make this happen, then it would have to be shorter and fatter. Uh, which would impact the open space. And so that'll be some of the trade-off that we'll be talking to the community about when we apply for a conditional use permit with uh, the city of Redondo Beach, probably here in the next couple of months. I'll give you a quick summary of that. And so this is, um, you know, this would be surface parking. That's going to be prospect straight out to your right there that you see. So we've made the circle here, but we just want to give people a sense kind of of what we're talking about. Because uh, it's sometimes hard to envision okay. maybe what uh, two acres of open space looks like. But I think you can see that this is a place that really reflects the healthy beach community and really reflects who we have evolved to over the last 60 years. So that's just a quick kind of um, three-dimensional view of, of the project. Okay, everyone bear with me. Sorry. <laughs> Give me one second. This is my first time on this video, so thanks for being here. Yeah, the video is a little tricky. It's good that it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. So. Okay. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go, Tom. I'll go quickly through the continuum of care. One thing we've we've heard loud and clear is that um, hey, we we want we want to be able to age in our home, and and we want to age in our home for as long as possible, and and we agree. And and Melissa was talking with you about some of the programs that we have that uh, help people do that. I think what we would add is we want is what we would add is we want people to be able to age in place. So that means uh, aging in their home for as long as possible. And then when they can no longer uh, age in their home safely, we want them to be able to age in the South Bay. So you can see on the far left, anything in blue is something that we're already doing in the South Bay. So you can see with the preventative care programs that Melissa talked about. Um, we're working with people to provide whatever resources, yeah. workshops. I heard some of you talking about some of the upcoming workshops that we have. Um, in the gray there is insurance, where there are some home supported programs through insurance. So that's, that's available to everybody. That's not something we offer, but we do provide, as Melissa was explaining, the care management where uh, we actively manage uh, cases for uh, 400 older adults in the in the beach cities, roughly at any time, 440 here it says. And I think Melissa explained the, what those services could be, whether it's uh, some in-home uh, in help or whether it's companionship or people helping with errands or uh, some light medical equipment. Those are all things that, that we currently offer. And then after that third column, you know, uh, people uh, now maybe they're living at um, they're living at home, but maybe uh, they can't get up the stairs, or maybe they're only living in a part of their house. Uh, and so that's where this pace program that I talked about would come in, where maybe uh, the person's caregiver is not there during the day, and they can uh, come to uh, the pace center during the day, or they can come uh, have their health needs met. It's really kind of like outpatient services, if you will, for older adults. And so that's kind of like the next phase. And then when someone can no longer safely be in their home, then uh, we want there to be a more assisted living available uh, in the beach cities. This is not apartments. This is not um, condos. This is not uh, senior housing. This is assisted living where people are, are receiving some sort of uh, assistance in their average daily living activities. And so the, and so that is something that there's not a lot of in the South Bay. There's Sunrise uh, and there's the Kensington, uh, but then there's really not a lot of that in the beach cities. And so uh, that is a health need uh, that we think needs to be met. Uh, there would be memory care. That's something that we're currently offering. And then there's skilled nursing, uh, which is something that we would not be offering. Uh, so we just kind of wanted to under, have people understand the context of what we're currently doing and then 
what what we're planning to do and how our campus we think meets that health need. One thing we hear a lot about is, well, oh, this is expensive and and it is. Residential care for the elderly is expensive depending upon the the level of assisted living care that you get. It could range anywhere on the, you can see on the right there from 4500 to 12,000 a month. It can be very expensive. So one thing we've been talking with people about is, is if possible, uh, to make sure that they have um, long-term care insurance, if they can get it, that's something that can be uh, difficult to get. But what we wanted to show in this chart here is um, if, if you're spending, you know, typically if you go to an agency, it's about $35 an hour. Uh, and so if you're, if you're having 24 hour care, uh, that's going to be a lot more than assisted living. Now, what people try to do is they try to have maybe a family member or a friend or somebody come and provide help for some of the day. What we've seen is if, if you need more than eight hours of care a day, um, you, you start to get to a point where assisted living um, is actually not as expensive as living at home. Plus you get the benefits of living in a community and what we're trying to create with our healthy living campus. And it hasn't been done before where you have assisted living adjacent to a public health campus like we have. And so um, we think there are a lot of benefits uh, for assisted living uh, when people get to a point where they can no longer uh, safely be in their home. For, for me, my father's 95 and lives up in Pasadena. And it, the, the, the big issue was, you know, that care overnight, you know, we, we can kind of manage through different sources, you know, providing the care uh, during the day, but but it was uh, it really starts to get expensive in the home uh, if you need someone there overnight. And of course, the big risk or what you're trying to prevent is a fall. And that's what, uh, you know, I, so I think people kind of push the envelope a little bit where, all right, I'm just not going to go upstairs anymore. I'm going to live in the in the bottom part of my house or uh, I'm going to sort of risk it. Uh, and, that, and that's what makes us uh, a little nervous. We, we want to create a place where people, again, can safely age in place. So one of the things we've done is we've asked folks, um, well, what do you think of this healthy living campus and this idea? And so uh, we did a statistically significant survey back um, almost a year ago. It was in November of 2021. And 61% uh, said that, uh, that they were in favor uh, of this when they received more information about it, uh, of what would be offered in the Healthy Living Campus, that number went up to 72%. Now, when we did that poll, we we did not do sort of the opponent's view or the, the other side of the case or story, if you will. And so we are gonna be doing another survey where we continue uh, to get people's opinion about, about this campus and, and whether it's something that they'd like to see. Do you have to be in the three cities to use this? Uh, now, you don't have to be in the three cities to use the campus uh, as it relates to the, so you can come enjoy the open space and be in the park and, and uh, but if you're gonna be, um, and then on the assisted living, there will likely be a preference for people in the beach cities um, first, but then um, no, you don't have to live in the beach cities to to live in the assisted living. Um, same for uh, the Alcove project, where we're expanding that service to include kids in the whole South Bay area. So the short answer is you don't have to be uh, okay. a resident um, to use the services. Um, again, we are asking about assisted living with this question in our survey and and uh, and so people sort of understood what I just explained with that continuum of care that, hey, when, if I get to a point or if a family member gets to a point where I can't safely remain in the home, yes, I would like to see some assisted living uh, in the South Bay. So that was another um, opinion that we heard. We had, a, we had a working group help us with the master plan over a couple of years. And so at one point we asked them, but this was years ago, about three years ago, we asked them, hey, did we sort of get it right? And, and again, I think what we're and what we heard was yes. Um, but again, people have different opinions. And what I really want to express today and something that we're trying to get the word out about is, hey, this is a master plan. Uh, we're getting ready to bring on a partner to help us build it. And 
and we're going to get specific now and and we're going to uh, look to address the concerns that we've been hearing from the neighborhood Be right back okay so again, um, wrapping up here, this is um, these are the benefits that we see from this new campus. This is a view kind of from um, the east and, and the north looking south and west. Um, so again, it helps us fund our programs, uh, meets a health need with the Youth Wellness Center, provides open space and a gathering space, which is something we heard from folks. It integrates the center of excellence principles of projects like Blue Zones. We're going to uh, address some environmental issues that are on the site. That current building doesn't meet current applicable seismic standards. And so uh, removing that building uh, is a plus in our mind. Uh, in phase one, through our environmental impact report, there will actually be less traffic in phase one because the uses have changed, right? They've changed from a medical office building and, a, and the Center for Health and Fitness that has lots of traffic uh, and lots of cars it, uh, to a use like assisted living uh, and youth wellness that, that doesn't have a lot of vehicles attached to it. Uh, so we're actually going to see less traffic. Um, we're looking to improve the bike path. It's a separate project really, but looking to improve uh, the bike path from diamond to barrel. As many of you know, that's a an old abandoned street and parts of it. and uh, we want to make that a better bike path. So what's next? Uh, the environmental impact report, that's the document that complies with the state law, which is called CEQA or the California Environmental Quality Act. That's been done. Um, that, that report has been completed and certified. And uh, it, it showed that there was one temporary impact that was significant, which is the noise during construction. Uh, but it did not show any other um, impacts or, or permanent impacts related to the project. Um, then uh, the next step is to uh, move forward with a developer. We are going to have a developer that's going to assist us uh, build the campus and build the uh, assisted living piece. We're going to do a land lease with them, uh, similar to what we've done with a couple of the other buildings on the on the campus. And so we have selected a developer. We're in the process of working on a ground lease with them. So once we have the developer all on board, then we're going to really get into the details of uh, the application for what's called a conditional use permit from the city of Redondo Beach. And we have a conditional use permit today for what we do there, right? For uh, the medical services we provide and for the memory care services that we provide. And so we're going to be doing uh, another uh, conditional use permit. And we're really going to be focusing on some of the things that we've been hearing. People are saying, hey, the buildings uh, are too tall. There's an electric substation that is located on the south end of the project, kind of near the homes on Diamond. And we've heard loud and clear from them that that's a concern. So we're going to try to address those concerns uh, between now and when we formally apply for a conditional use permit. And then we think that process will take about a year. And then we hope to be breaking ground in, in 2023, uh, late 2023. And then uh, about a year from now, hopefully. And then uh, it'll be about two years, uh, uh, two to two and a half years to build it. So that's just a quick overview of the campus. Uh, again, trying to create a place that reflects who we are and balances those, those needs that I talked about. So happy to answer any 